look, if teachers really want to address what students are struggling with, they have to address the whole student. And people are people, humans being with hearts, with consciousnesses, with um, uh, souls. So, um, yeah, the danger of that is trying to superimpose our own journey onto somebody else's rather than saying, tell me where you are. This episode contains adult language and adult humor. Since when have trumpet players ever been considered adults? If you are easily offended by these types of conversations, consider switching to the oboe. Welcome to the Trumpet Gurus Hang Podcast. I'm your host, Jose Johnson. My guest for this episode is Nathan Warner. Nathan, well, he's an eclectic kind of guy. His path has led him from attending the Interlochen Arts Camp to a bachelor's degree in jazz studies at the Indiana School of Music, a master's degree in classical trumpet from the Manhattan School of Music, and finally, a DMA from Stony Brook University. He's a busy performer, a passionate educator, and co-founder of the Apex Trumpet Summit, and he manages to do everything with serious swag and perfect hair. So, pour yourself a big glass, pull up a chair, and let the hang begin! All right, and uh, we are here for another exciting episode of the Trumpet Gurus Hang, and I am joined by Dr. Nathan Warner. Nathan, greetings, my friend. So great to be with you, friend. How are you? Uh, I am just uh, so wonderful that uh, if, it, if I was any more happier, there, there'd have to be two of me. Um, <laughs> actually, that, that could also be because of all the Krispy Kreme I ate this morning. So um, There's also that. Yeah. yeah. Keep eating Krispy Kreme. There will be two of you. Exactly. It might be three at some point. Uh, so anyway, it, it is a, a pleasure to, to, to get to meet you finally. I've heard uh, so many wonderful glowing reviews of you as a, uh, as a person, as a teacher, uh, as a uh, fashion icon, and all <laughs> of the things that, that you are. Uh, obviously, you are a tremendous player. You know, I've checked out some of your stuff. And, and um, yeah, man, you, you, you got, you, you're, the, you're the total package. So, um, uh, you know, the fact that you would humble yourself to be on such a, uh, a lowly podcast such as this is, uh, I'm eternally grateful. So, well, it's, it's funny. I, I feel the same way about you and your work. And, and anytime someone takes the word trumpet and, and gurus and puts them together, you know, I'm, I'm already thinking, okay, this is a person who gets that it's more about tucka tucka and da 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 right? Um, so I'm, I'm humbled to be here. I'm, I'm flattered by your words and, and I, um, I'm honored to be a part of this. Well, yeah, you've been doing so much uh, work. I mean, you obviously as a as a professional, as a trumpet player, uh, you know, mm -hmm. you're contributing to uh, the art form. As an educator, you're helping to uh, groom an, a new generation of of players. Uh, and then uh, the work that you've been uh, doing with Apex, with uh, with uh, Dave Dash and uh, Mary Elizabeth, uh, that is kind of taking. Uh, taking things up a notch in many ways. Um, so let's kind of start with that because I'm really curious as to how the three of you, uh, you know, became the, the three amigos and, and do you have a, a secret handshake that goes along with <laughs> I love it. Um, well, it, it, first of all, I, I can say that that being able to launch a business with two of your best friends is an absolute privilege. Um, <clears throat> especially when your friendship is old enough and trusting enough and has good boundaries so that you can go into business without unbecoming best friends. Um, and so the three of us kind of found sweet spots as far as what our roles were in the business so that we don't step on any toes. And, and what's great is that I've only grown closer to these two people uh, through this process. How did it start? It started um, during quarantine as you know a lot of brain childs were birthed as you know during quarantine and um i was watching the news quite a bit um black lives was going on um a lot of people suffering with uh 
coronavirus. My community was hit really hard with it. Vaccine wars. Um, it just seemed like the the world had become a dumpster fire. And as an empath, when you watch the news, it can be really draining uh, and painful to watch. And um, I called Dave and Mary, or they called me. I can't remember, but we uh, we're we have three way calls all the time. And I said to Mary and Dave, I've been looking for fixer upper villas in Italy because I just want to like get out of here, live in a villa, teach remotely, maybe play like a restaurant gig once a week and enjoy La Dolce Vita. You know, I just wanted to get out. Um, now, Mary, who is a force of nature when it comes to dreaming, scheming, etc., said, wait a minute, talk about that some more. And I said, well, I found this really cool villa, you know, and she's like, no, 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 the online thing. So um, in that conversation, we hatched the idea for Apex about having an online masterclass academy that would meet a couple times a week. And we, you know, we've been around long enough that we know some really great players, teachers, etc. And we knew that there was sort of a void as far as interaction for trumpet players, especially in middle America, uh, with guest artists, because they were barely getting their lessons from their schools at the time, let alone master classes. So um, from conception to launch, I think was maybe six weeks. It was unreal how quickly we turned this thing around. And I, um, we sold out our first session and um, had incredible guest artists. I think we had eight guest artists. And then, of course, uh, Dave and Mary and myself were the principal teachers, core, we call the core teaching artists. So we were giving fundamentals classes, master classes, topic lectures, mock auditions, et cetera. And what I found was we created not just um, a masterclass platform, but a forum for people to flex their muscles that had been kind of dormant, right? And what happened in that was this profound connection between musicians, not just trumpet players, but musicians who were realizing via the absence of their muse, how important this was to them. And so in the process, the platform not only became something great for technique, fundamentals, musicianship, but also became a really important support network. And what I found was it was the antithesis of the typical American music school masterclass with, you know, people cutting each other, the one upsmanship, the, uh, the posturing, the toxic perfectionism, the, uh, the talking down to via, you know, from teachers to students. And, um, I became, as did Mary and Dave, we were shrunk down to um, participants in this, even though we were core teachers. I think we were, we all became equal learners in the process. And uh, I found myself at the end of that first session, just moved to tears saying goodbye to these people because we, were, we weren't going to be meeting every Thursday and Saturday anymore. And um, so for Dave and Mary and myself, you know, Corona was not going away anytime soon. We said, Let, let's do this again. Let's do it again. We ended up, I think, doing four semesters and a summer session of it before things kind of opened up again. But every single semester had profound moments of connection, of triumph, of healthy failure, um, um, we were addressing strengths 
and not weaknesses, but this is actually something I, I have brought to the group. We call it um, strengths and future strengths. And um, to watch the students thrive in that positive mindset community was unbelievable even though we were online and playing from our living rooms or closets or whatever. Um, so yeah, I mean, just an absolutely inspiring community. I'm humbled to be a part of it and we're going to go live um, next summer. So, um, you know, as people have gotten busier and things have opened up, we've found that uh, the demand for the zoom thing, everyone's tired of it. We're exhausted. Okay. This is a novelty to be on a zoom meeting now. This, you know, but it used to be, oh gosh, another one. Um, so we said, you know, we need to transition to what people need. Let's do this in person. All these people who have just been, you know, floating torsos on a screen, you know, Dr. Claw, if you will, <laughs> let's, uh, let's make this an in-person thing and get our people together and meet because it, it became an online family. And each semester, as new people would join, I think people were just kind of struck by, oh, I can just come as as I am. I don't need to do the, you know, puffing out of the chest or the high, fast, and loud thing. Um, what I loved about Apex is that it was in what we saw as our imperfections, where the it was precisely there that we had to go through for growth and being 100% okay with that. Um, and I grew up in a music school climate where mistakes were 100% not okay. So um, I think that's what we're providing. And I'm so excited to see what's going to happen with this thing, because it's not just the masters that we are bringing in. It's not just the teaching we have, but it's also the environment that the students get to be a part of. Uh, it's the the sunshine and water that the plants need to grow, you know. So, um, yeah. Well, that's that's an amazing journey. I mean, as as someone who has has launched uh, several businesses over my lifetime, um, the fact that you're able to do that in such a short time is a testament to uh, the. I, I hate to say talents, I guess, uh, skills, because things are, are kind of, they're, they're, they're learned and developed, but uh, you know, the, the unique contributions that each of you brought to the table, coupled with the passion for the project, because no matter how much, you know, if you, if you don't feel it in here, then you're never going to go through those hard times that, that you have to go through the, the tough questions you have to ask the adjustments you have to make to, to make things work. So yeah, it's it's a it's a great testament, um, and one of the things that you said that, that kind of has stuck out uh, to me is uh, you know the the idea of filling filling a need, and um, you know with with uh, the COVID thing. I mean, obviously my my podcast launched during COVID. It wasn't in, it wasn't a COVID project. It just the timing just happened to be that way. That by the time I was finally ready to do it, it was oh, well, guess I better do it. Uh, but the whole idea of maintaining community and that is such a crucial part. And, and you know, as you're saying, you know, somebody in middle America, they're going to have, they, they're going to have a difficult time having access to some of the world-class talent that's out there. Uh, and so things like uh, the, the virtual uh, conferences, this podcast, other things like that is just a way of, of getting uh, the information uh packaged in a way that's more accessible to, to more people. Um, and I think maybe to me also, the one of the, the, the big things that you said that, that uh, resonated with me is the, the need for the teachers to teach. It's like, if you're a performer and you can't perform, you need to perform. You're going to feel the itch. If you're a teacher and you can't teach, you, you, you need to do that. You need to, you need to flex your chops every once in a while just to, uh, to feel like you're contributing so you know there's, there's such a great service that that you guys have provided um so we, you know when, when you think about the 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 future or the the arc that you're trying to, to create with with this um going now uh, going from virtual to live as opposed to many pe people who went from live to virtual um do you think that you're going to have like a hybrid uh 
kind of presentation at some point where where you have the options of doing both live and virtual? Or are you going to just kind of go for head on into keeping it live as long as you can? Well, I think that's that's a great question. Um, there's so many unknowns with that right now. Um, obviously, the first time you do anything, you have no idea what's going to happen. Having, uh, I, you know, I, I remember when we did the first virtual Apex, we had no idea how many people would show up. Um, we didn't know what it was going to become. Uh, and it's, it's, in fact, the students who helped define that vibe at the beginning. Um, and, you know, I think what we may end up having is this being maybe even a multi-session thing um, live with supporting um, Zoom sessions during the year, like uh, say a master class here and there where, um, you know, people can sign up and, and do a fundamentals class, right? Have a, an introduction to jazz vocabulary, um, have a class on audition preparation. Uh, Dave Dash gives a great class on that. Um, Dave is an incredible auditioner. And um, so he has some great wisdom for that. But but I think what I'm trying to say is right now, we are really trying to stress getting this live thing launched. And if that is great, then I think it can be supported by some occasional online things. If that be a guest artist, or if that be you know, one of the core teaching artists that remains to be seen. But right now our energies are really poured into the the live thing and uh, getting all these ghosts on the screen all together, right? A family reunion, if you will. Yeah, yeah. And it sounds like a great idea. Yeah. Um, now, now you had mentioned uh, that your experience in, uh, in music education uh, had been one where failure was was a dirty word um so i mean and and you've you've gone through a lot of very prestigious programs um interlocking indiana uh was it manhattan school music uh correct yeah so, and Stanbrook. Yeah. yep yeah so so uh you know you work with some some phenomenal teachers and some phenomenal uh settings um but still there's there's a feeling uh or at least i'm getting the opinion that that while you got tremendous you know results and i'm sure i have tremendous respect for the people and the, the institutions that there still has been an environment that is maybe in some ways counterproductive to us yeah. attaining our true potential uh right and, you know let me be clear about what i was saying um i'm not sure that that climate was created by the teachers but i know that it was very prevalent among my peers that you know clams were the devil <laughs> you know uh spleas were punishable by death those sort of things and um when that happened i realized that i was trying to avoid mistakes rather than to play something beautiful and it's never why i got into music um, I was walking on eggshells uh, when I was playing. I even remember at Manhattan School, uh, we had a world famous conductor who will remain nameless, especially since they're no longer living, come and work with our orchestra, who during the concert was shouting at us on stage. And one of the string players we were speaking at intermission and she said, doesn't the orchestra sound incredible? And I remember even then saying, I think I was 23, 24, I said, yes, but I never want to make music like this again. It's not, it's, that's, this is not it. You know, it's like, sure, I'm, I have the choice of making beautiful music of my own volition or making beautiful music because there's a gun to my head. Um, and I started choosing then, I think. And I, I have to say, I think it really was driven by the students, not the teachers. It was a very immature approach to music. And, and please know that when I say this, I'm not putting myself above it. I, I was part of that. You know, I judged people the same way. I would go to concerts where 
uh, the orchestra was playing something uh, and I wasn't in the concert and I would judge who was ever playing principal by how many spleas they had, you know, like sitting there keeping a tally. Toxic, man. Toxic, not supportive at all. And I have to say, you know, I, I, I feel like I did bring some of this to Apex, but the vast majority of this came from the students. Um, and I learned a lot about that positivity and that optimism from them that first semester. Young people are really resilient, man. They they really are. They they fall down, they get back up. And in the middle of that quarantine, when they had every right to feel the most despondent, I saw some of the most hopeful cats I've ever been around. Yeah. Well, you know, it, adversity you know, we think when we think about like trial by fire, you know, that that the whole idea is, you know, you, you either get burned up or you get refined through the process. You 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 either uh you're gonna you're gonna fold and quit or you're you're going to learn a lesson and you're gonna move forward and you'll be better through the process. And I think that uh you know, obviously we've had to learn some lessons uh societally because of of what's happened my greatest fear and this is you know kind of the pessimist in me i i i generally tend to be a very optimistic person I actually i'm more of a realistic person but um the um uh, that my greatest fear is that all of the lessons that we were forced to learn uh we will quickly forget because we want to we want things to go back to the way they were and the way they were doesn't work anymore and and it, it never worked. It worked okay, but it didn't. It wasn't the perfect. Uh, and there's no such thing as a perfect world anyway. But uh, you know, there's so many there's so many things that could be changed, but we don't change them because we're entrenched in the system that we've created around it. Whether it be music or whether it be you know social gatherings or politics, whatever it is, yeah, you know, we we can't make a change because we're so invested in what we've already created. So. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when when we look at at these times, you know, the the darkest times are in terms of of art are that some some of the op uh, some of the greatest works have been created out of the darkness because you know your soul is kind of aching and hurting and you want to either release that or you feel the need to bring some beauty into the world because things are so bad so the it seems to be a fertile ground for creativity but only if you allow that creativity to grow and to be processed so um you know it seems like uh you know when when you're talking about like the the atmosphere that we have particularly like in uh you know high level performance but even in low level it's the same thing um the inability to acknowledge that the mistakes are part of the learning process and that uh if we don't go through that trouble that hardship right now that we're never going to achieve what we could truly achieve down the line so i mean how I, as, as an educator how do you how do you personally uh, take that on your on yourself and try to invite uh, you know share that concept with your students and, and encourage them to to walk down this path. Um, I love the concept of yes and. So when a student, for example, if so, if a student plays Don Juan for me, okay, one of the first things that I'll do is I'll play the old Cleveland Edelstein recording, which has one of the most epic spliaz in the recorded history of music but the sound and the expressivity is incredible so number one i try to give them permission to be exactly where they are as a student um you know i i, I try to tell them and I, tr I try to say all this to me because i've been saying this to me as well i i really think that the way we treat our students the way we treat anybody else exactly mirrors the way we treat ourselves right if I'm not at peace with me, I'm I'm not going to be at peace with my brother. That's just how how it goes. Um, but I'm, I try to give people permission to be exactly where they are. If this is a journey, we're talking about, okay, we're going to set the GPS for what we want. And when you set a GPS, you need two points where you want to go, but also exactly where you are. Okay, so people come into master classes or lessons 
and they're trying to play like <laughs> perfect. They're trying to be the record. And okay, cool. If that's if that's whatever stimulates your imagination for playing, but if by not achieving that, you're telling yourself that you're not enough or that you're falling short or you're deficient or whatever, then all of a sudden um, the mistakes are not useful. So I always tell my students, never waste a good clam, you know, and uh, because through that one spot, there's so much to be learned. Okay. So listen to that clam. Are you over, are you too high or too low? What, what's your, what's your clam telling you, right? Let's, let's sing it. Let's buzz it and let's play it and find out what's really going on, right? So I, I like to use the, the, the lie detector, the polygraph that is singing and buzzing to find out what the musician is doing on the inside. Um, because one of my first reminders for these students uh, and to myself is that we're not trying to be great trumpet players here. We're trying to be great musicians, right? Now my voice type is trumpet, okay? But you know, you can hear people who play the horn and you don't think of them as trumpet players. They've transcended that. You hear personality, you hear stories, you hear feelings. You know, anytime I listen to Miles, like on the Gil Evans stuff, or I listen to uh, Dizzy having the time of his life on like Oop Bop Shabam, or, um, or I hear Bud telling this epic story via a tone poem with CSO. Um, or I hear um, Clark Terry making us all laugh, um, playing with a, a, a trumpet and a harmony mute and a flugel in the other hand. You know, that's what I remember. It's not uh, how great is their fingering or how great is their tucka tucka or yada yada i always tell my students look you make your picture this you make your debut at carnegie and you walk out on the 56th street the stage door afterwards and two juilliard kids walk up to you and one says yeah man i really dig your embouchure like you're really well set and uh you know your tone is really consistent and your articulation is like right on the money Sign my program. Okay, cool, fine. And then the next kid comes up and says, that was so musical and expressive and it transported me tonight. Thank you for sharing your humanity through your music. I know which one I'd rather hear, right? Now, here's the thing. I don't think those two things have to be mutually exclusive because if I'm having the time of my life, you know, the technique's gonna follow that, right? My my expressivity as a speaker doesn't mean that I have to have poor vocabulary. In fact, the vocabulary helps me to be more expressive, right? So um, it's sort of been an either or thing. And we as humans inherently, and you know this, we tend to be dualistic in our thinking. I shouldn't say, even say tend. We gravitate toward that naturally. So that's why I'm very into the concept of yes and. So if someone plays something with a splia, you know, all right. So I try to give the student two positives and then say, okay, now this is a really interesting spot. This one note that you, that you, this, I call them distractions. All right. You had a distraction on measure four, it sounded like. And when I say distraction, they nod their head, right? I learned this from Bill Adam. He said, the moment that we make a, he called it a mistake. The moment that we make a mistake is the exact same moment that we didn't hear it well enough here. And he pointed to his head, you know, he meant, meant our brain. So um, my job as I see it, or my vocation is to do everything that I can to strengthen my song envision it and bring it to reality with as little or no distortion as possible and to enable that to foster that in the environment in which my students can do the exact same thing and i talk about van gogh quite a bit so let's say you know i i, I like to think that when van gogh painted starry night 
what ended up on the canvas is exactly what he envisioned in his head. Now, what we know about Van Gogh and his opium and absinthe use may lead us to believe that that is exactly what he saw in his head. But but it's it's just like every other great art, visualize, execute. And when I visualize, it has very little to do with what anybody else thinks of it, right? Now, there are certain things that we keep in mind, like, am I going to play in tune, in time, uh, in context with those around me, right? And art does have to have boundaries, right? Um, And those boundaries can be stretched. And sometimes what we do to the boundaries is the art, where the medium is the message. But um, that freedom to just be and to just sing, that's what I'm trying to enable in my lessons, right? In fact, I don't even call them lessons. This, this is a Penzarella thing. He was one of my teachers. He was my, my principal teacher at Manhattan School. Vince Penzarella said, um, he asked me, who's your teacher? And I said, you are, maestro. And he said, no, no, you are your teacher. I'm your consultant. This isn't even a lesson. This is a consultation. So I will provide information. That's the other thing you could consider me. He said, you could call me a provider of information and you go home every day and you give yourself a lesson based on that information. And at the end of each day, ask yourself two questions. How well did I teach me today? And number two, how well did I learn from me today? And then all of a sudden it becomes my thing, right? He made that very clear from the beginning, man. You know, I think one of the most toxic traits that I see from students, and I see few from students because young people I think are inherently very good people. But I think one of the the falsehoods that, that have taken over the young mind is that when you go to music school, you go to a teacher who's gonna make you good, make you a great player. Um, I, I learned from Penzarella, I want to go to a music school where I encounter teachers that have a lot of information and a lot of inspiration. And then I go home into my laboratory like a mad scientist and I tinker and I try and I fail and I learn from the failure and I get up and I keep going. And I try a million times over and over and over again. And I get so familiar with the song that it becomes second nature, right? Um, I don't know if you're a Star Wars cat, but um, I, I'm, you know, Trumpet teachers all the time are quoting Yoda, and and I'm I'm so into that dude. Um, episode eight, Yoda comes back as like the blue apparition. I remember going to see the movie a second time and looking around the theater, and you know people from our generation. I don't know if you remember that moment when we see Yoda on the screen again, but yeah. smiles everywhere, right? It's yeah. all of us wanted at that age because we were all we all identified with Luke because here's this young learner in need of a mentor, in need of a father figure, right? Um, Same thing when I saw Karate Kid, you know, we all wanted a Miyagi in our in our lives. But um, at a moment of failure, even after Luke had become one of the most powerful Jedi masters, you know, the Jedi tree is burning, yada, yada. And Yoda looks at Luke and says, failure, the greatest teacher is. And man, I put that in my back pocket and went in my practice room with it, you yeah. know? So, uh, yeah, two words, failure and frustration. I think I'm trying to harness into strengths because, um, again, failure is a great teacher and frustration is proof that improvement is happening within our midst. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm actually uh, <clears throat> right now working on a, a presentation I have to do in, a, in a, uh, a few days on flow, on the concept of flow. And, There's another F word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah with, you know, if you're a musician, you have plenty of F words in your, your arsenal. True. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the idea that, that flow, uh, you know, being a peak performance state, you know, optimal uh, circumstances, um, that one of the precursors to flow is frustration. You have to feel frustration because if you never go through that process, 
uh, that that's where you're starting to to reach where you need to be for flow, which is where you're at the sweet spot between. Uh, it's called like the challenge skills sweet spot, where the de- where the demands are just a little bit beyond what you would normally consider your your acceptable range of ability. So that's how you get in the flow. You have to get frustrated, and you have to be in a situation where you have you are pushing your boundaries, and that inevitably leads to uh, the other F word, the failure word, because you you suddenly find yourself in a situation where you uh, don't have the requisite skills or abilities or comprehension to make things yes. work. So then Absolutely. you back out of it and you go, okay, well, you know, everything went well, except for this. Now I can go back in the woodshed and I can shed on the thing that I had the problem with, develop that skill. So the next time I can push myself even further. So uh, I've always told my, my students, um, I, never, I was never much of a, of a trumpet, of, of a music teacher, but I definitely, you know, martial arts uh, teacher for, you know, three decades. Uh, I always told my students, you know, I would ask them at the end of class, I said, okay, who feels more confused now than you did when you came into class and inevitably a few people were kind of ashamed drop their head and put their hand up and I go you are the ones who are making the progress yes. because if if you feel frustrated if you feel confused that means you're in the learning process if you feel yeah. like oh, yeah, I got this I got this well then this class wasn't you know particularly uh, a, a a good experience for you so uh, you know, learn to, to embrace the suck, learn to be uncomfortable, be, being uncomfortable, be comfortable, being uncomfortable, you know, all these different little phrases that float around. But I think that's, that's the hardest part for most of us, because uh, we, we don't like that feeling, we don't like the feeling of uncertainty, we don't like the feeling of uh, having holes in our abilities and our, our, our skills. But when we can shift that and go, well, when I have trouble with something, that means it's an opportunity to learn and to get better. So, hey, absolutely, that's exciting. Yeah, and it, you know, it is still a scary place to live, to be in that place. Um, and, you know, proof of what you're talking about, um, all of us take a few days off from the horn sometimes for a one reason or another, like if we're moving or if, you know, we go to a funeral somewhere or, you know, whatever. Um, Learning something the first time is always the most frustrating. I remember Arben's page 75, the Goldman edition, Tucka Tucka. And the first time going through those first few pages of that was murder. Really, really tough. These days, if I haven't worked on double tonguing for like six months or so, I can go back and get back into shape with that in a few days, right? Because I I learned enough from it the first time that going back, yes, it will take some time, but not nearly as much. So the frustration isn't as palpable. Does that make sense? Um, and so I tell students the, the you know, new stuff is really difficult. My colleague, Dave Dash, says it very well. He says, unfamiliar equals uncomfortable. Familiar equals comfortable. You choose. And our unfamiliarity with things really begets a lot of tension, a lot of doubt, a lot of fear, a lot of insecurity, things that are really difficult to deal with as trumpet players. So I think our job is to do as much as we can to have the experience of what we'll need on stage when it happens, right? especially if you're an improviser, because I don't know what I'm going to imagine when I get up to play, but I want there to be as little hindering me from what I imagine, what I conceive to what comes out of the bell translation to what moves the audience. So, um, yeah, I mean that's that's where I'm trying to live these days. But you're you're exactly right with that idea of flow. I mean, how many times have we taken days off and we come back and we're trying to slur up an octave? And <laughs> what I always forget, Ed Cord told me this great trumpet teacher, great trumpet player. He uh, played with the Utah Symphony, Israel Phil, 
um, taught at Indiana for years. Um, Ed Court said, remember that a slur is actually a non-entity. It's the nothingness between two notes. But we try to make a slur a something rather than just getting out of the way and letting the two notes sound. And I'm very guilty of that. All right, I need to work on slurring. No, I don't. I need to work on doing nothing between these two notes. That's what it is. So very often it is addition via subtraction, you know, and my spiritual life mirrors this. So much of what I'm learning as a spiritual being now is about letting go of things, uh, about allowing things to be unveiled rather than fighting the dragon. And um, boy, it takes a lot of courage to let go. See things that we've held on to our whole lives, patterns from our parents, um, patterns that we've adopted to survive as young people that we still hold on to um, subconsciously as adults. Um, and it's hard to do that because we have survived via these patterns. But I have come to the point where I realized I'm not here to survive. I'm here to thrive. Right. And, you know, when I play a piece, I don't want to survive the piece. I don't want to, you know, play it perfectly, play it safe, have it all be in this little box, you know, nail it. The people behind the screen, give me the gig. Okay, cool. What did I create? Right. What, um, did I tell the story? And, you know, there's a place for playing stuff. Great. Yes. If along the journey, I can tell the story as accurately and as shimmeringly beautiful as possible. That's great. Okay. Yes. And because I've been to concerts where I come out and I'm like, wow, that was really in tune. <laughs> you know, but but it didn't move me one little bit. I grew up two hours east of Chicago. I would take the train in and go hear Bud Herseth. And I heard a miss. But boy, what I would I, what I would give to be able to miss with a sound like that. You know, I, it's like I would love to be able to hit a foul ball as far as A-Rod could. You know, <laughs> like I don't even need to hit the homer. Just let me send it out of the park backwards. You know, <laughs> just just that. So um what what and this is kind of a cool thing about apex is that mary brings so much ambition and work ethic and ability to um persevere dave brings so much discipline and focus and calm and i i think that what i bring to the trifecta is just a lot of passion and a lot of freedom to be for for everybody around us to just be who they are and to to shine that light and i think those three things put together there's there are three very unique ingredients i don't have what mary has i don't have what dave has and vice versa all the way around that trifecta but it's such an interesting force field that gets created um so yeah, I think you're exactly right. You know, when when we're not willing to deal with the struggle of learning something new, that frustration point, you know, the, the carrot's dangling right there, right? We don't grow. We don't grow. I mean, Frederick Douglass put it really well. He said, with, with no struggle, there can be no progress, right? Um, and why do we resist struggle so much? Right. All of our all of our greatest heroes that we identify with that we want to be went through the struggle. Right. I mean, Jason didn't have the golden fleece delivered via Amazon. That's not how that worked. He had to go out and deal with all this stuff along the way. So. It, yeah, it takes a special kind of resilience, I think, to realize that there is a purpose in that struggle to be okay with it. I've been recently reading a ton of Richard Rohr. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Incredible spiritual writer. Um, he's a, a Franciscan priest living in Albuquerque. And um, he writes about 
differentiating between pain and suffering. And he says, pain is universal to all of man, mankind. We all suffer pain. At, we all deal with pain at, at some point. He said, suffering is when we avoid pain, when we refuse to sit with it, right? And that, you know, that's a very broad thing. And we deal with it in micro moments in our practice. You know, oh, I'll just play that again and the clam will go away. Well, okay, yeah, cool. But then you didn't learn anything from it. And that means it might come back, right? So yeah, the, the avoidance thing never helps me learn, right? In other words, what's in the way is the way. Does that make sense? The struggle is the way. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's um, it, like in, in Buddhist philosophy, um, there's a concept of... Uh, of the darks, you know, that, that, you know, when you, you have uh, a pain, right. So the, the pain is the primary thing. Something happens you know, in trumpet terms, you know, you miss a note. Okay. Well, great. You missed a note and you're going to maybe feel embarrassed. You're going to maybe feel frustrated. You're going to maybe feel angry, whatever at that moment, because you didn't do what you intended to do. But then we, we use the second darts and the third darts. So we, we, uh, we start to, in, interject uh you know uh feelings of anxiety about what might come up next or we start mm -hmm. to interject uh feelings of uh depression because we didn't practice as hard or you know so so we start to add we we pile pains on top of pains instead of just saying okay well this was not what i wanted okay it wasn't what I wanted. Let's move on to the next thing and then try to make sure that we're that that we're staying on the path that we intended to be on and not getting sucked off into this kind of negative, uh, negative spiral, downward spiral. So yeah, the the, the everything is up here anyway, you know, it, it's it's here. It's how you're you're thinking and you're interpreting things. And then here it's the 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 heart, the uh the emotional overlay that we put on everything. And I think if if we're ever having problems in life, it's either you're, you're thinking about things wrong, you're you're lacking the knowledge, uh, so that's a mental process, or that you just have the wrong passion, you have the wrong emotions uh, related to it, and those can be adjusted. And until they get adjusted, then you're never going to get the results that you're really looking for because you're never going to be able to act the way you need to act. So yeah. you know, for you, because as if we were doing our our pre pre hang hang uh you had mentioned something about uh you know the 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 spirit of music the the fellowship the the the, uh, the muse that we all uh are are seeking to connect with so you know, how i guess it will we'll kind of have this as a multi-part question which you can just kind of riff on um you know, like what is the level of importance that you find uh, of that kind of uh, deeper emotional spiritual connection to the music, uh, and how do you how do you process that, and then how do you help to explain that to other people? Wow, yeah, um, you know, I I have to say these days, I've I've gone through a real war with my motivation. Or, uh, in other words, uh, becoming one with my original motivation. You know, I remember being a kid and getting the goosebumps when all of us were playing music together, right? And that's why I wanted to be a musician. I learned this big time during Corona because you know I went out and bought a ribbon mic and was recording and sending stuff to people, and I realized, okay, this is this is cool, and I'm like making some money doing this. But the reason I got into music is because I love being on stage, making music with my friends, that this is a social art form. I'm not some savant with a grand piano in a room. You know, I, I need to be connected with people when I play. But um, what I find every day is the most important thing that I'm working on is waking up, being grateful, seeing my abundance, being okay with me, being okay with my creator, and bringing that peace into my session, okay? 
um, all of us have had moments of severe emotional angst. And you can practice for two hours and get nothing done. You know, we're just distracted. We're not at peace, whatever. And I've found that an hour of practice can be worth six <laughs> if I'm really focused. Um, and I've heard teachers say this before. You could play, you could practice for four hours or you could practice for one hour with love. And, you know, that's, that's huge, right? The, the voices, <laughs> and they're there, I'll be honest, the voices in my head, which I worked on, uh, especially over coronavirus, over quarantine, um, are plenty dangerous. And I found that for years, I would go out on stage with some really bad stage fright. And so instead of seeing that as a character flaw or trying to fight it, I started to look at it and say, okay, what, what, what can be learned here? And I realized after a lot of angst that it wasn't clamming a note that I was afraid of. It wasn't what the audience would think that I was afraid of. It wasn't what the audience would say that I was afraid of. It wasn't what the press would say. It wasn't what the artist that I was playing with would say. It was what I would say to me if I missed. Because nobody can hurt me like me deeper than I can. And so I realized I had some ancient voices of mentors, family in my past, uh, that negative voice in my head. And I really had to deal with that. So these days, one of the most important parts of my practice session is my spiritual pursuits of my day. Okay. Now, when when you ask, okay, how, how can you do that for other people or, or encourage other people? I, I think that the only advice that I can give anybody about a spiritual journey is to have it. That's it. Because nobody's path looks alike, right? We're all built completely differently. There is not one trumpet student that I've had in, in, you know, geez, almost 30 years of teaching that has the same teeth or lips or lungs or fingers as me. So it really has to be about, I can give you a little bit of information about this experience, but it's your journey. Just like I can't drink your water for you, I can't sleep for you, I can't eat your food for you. You've got to do those things on your journey. And when it comes to being okay with oneself, everybody's got a different story, man. Some people have some really heavy stuff they're carrying with them, right? And I know, you know, I know this is a, a trumpet podcast, but I, I, I know we, one of our toxic traits is we tend to separate the human from the playing. And in some ways that's really healthy, right? But if it's only that, then we have no... Uh, sense of the personification of our being in our playing, right? Which is why I got into it in the first place. I grew up a kid of a choir director. Um, I was singing my song on the trumpet. And I've always gravitated towards players that were doing that. Louis Armstrong, right? Dizzy, um, Chet, Right, people who on the trumpet were singing a song. You can tell when there's something beyond just trumpet playing there. And I tended not to be attracted at all to people who were just nailing it. I wanted to hear someone who had a story, an urgency, uh, a reaching out to the audience, right? But I cannot reach out to the audience unless I first reach inside me. I can't do that. I I can't bring a sense of peace and love to a listener until that happens inside of me. Now, <laughs> I, I know this is like hella deep for a conversation like this, but I think it's time that we stop separating the soul life from the musical pursuit. You know, I heard Kirk Whalem give a speech at a jazz education network conference once. And he said, 
why are we always telling people about John Coltrane's drug problems, but we never talk about all the things that he went through spiritually, all of his pursuits that he went through as far as learning about his soul? We never talk about that. I learned about that much later in life. You know, I just knew this guy had a heroin issue, died too young, right? Got kicked out of Miles' band. Teachers love telling me about that, but they wouldn't have the soul conversation. Okay. I've had very few teachers that have imparted information like that to me. And the, 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 I think couple that I have had, boy, I remember that stuff. I remember that stuff. I, I, here's a story, Ed Cord, who I was talking about earlier, you know, he, um, I think the story is he, he won principal with the Israel Philharmonic. And I think he converted to Judaism while living in Tel Aviv. And he would say, um, every good Jew should carry two pieces of paper, one in each pocket. And on one piece of paper, it should be written, you are but dust. And on the other piece of paper, it should say, for you, the universe was created. And live with both of those pieces of paper. And the tension between those two poles is where you find truth. You can't be dualistic in that sense. It's yes and. And so, again, you know, the only advice I can give when it comes to a spiritual pursuit is to have one because we are by nature spiritual people. And over and over and over again, the most profound musicians that we listen to have gone through something spiritually, have had rock bottom moments, have had to turn to something stronger than themselves. Um. I think it's beautiful and it's time to start telling those stories and to share them and to learn from them. Yeah. Well, you know, it, we're like, we, as we were talking earlier about the concepts like flow, um, we talk about spirituality and I mean, and, and first of all, I mean, uh, it, it, I think it's important to, to have the distinction between spirituality and religion. And I think sometimes we, Absolutely. Get, we get caught up in the, the, the dogmatic practice of things instead of, uh, it, to me, spirit, spirituality is the is when you understand and accept that you are a minuscule part of a something that is much greater than you. And yes. That while you are, you know, kind of like with that that idea of you know you're dust, but the universe is created for you. Uh, that while you are a minuscule part, you're still an important part. Yes. And, that that the universe the universe would not be what it is if you weren't here mm -hmm. to make the the make this world the best world it could be the best thing that you can do is be the best you that, that you can be and you know yeah. you feel like you don't have that much impact but yeah you know, reality is we have much more impact than we think we do through our, through right. our thoughts and our actions and our examples so um I think that like as a as a musician that you know, I've said this countless times on the on the podcast, uh, you know, music to me is a form of communication. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a way of taking what's in here and what's in here and expressing it in a way that other people get it. You know, they you you let them in on the inner workings of you. And when when we become, I think when we become more spiritually aware or awake. Um, we understand that interconnectedness of the human experience. And mm -hmm. that gives us freedom. It, it gives us freedom to express more, but it also then lets us tap into the greater source, you know, the force, whatever you want to call it, that, that exists outside of us. So that's those moments that we lose the sense of self, the ego, when that disappears, then that's when creativity can actually start to flow in ways yes. that astound us, you know? Yeah. That's when we yeah. make those changes. Those are when we make this impact that changes someone else's life. But like you said before, you got to start with yourself. You've got to be willing to change who you are and how you look at the world if you want to make that level of impact. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, and, you know, another idea from Richard Rohr, um, you know, you, you speak of spirituality versus religion. 
He's got a great one for that. He says, religion is lived by people seeking to avoid hell. And spirituality is lived by people who have been through hell, <laughs> which I, I think is, yeah, I love that. I love that. And, you know, all of us with our inner voices and, and our discouragement and our doubt and our fear, our anxiety have been through hell on earth with that. It's, it's, so we find a way to find love within ourselves that way. Now, let me be very clear about this. When this comes to <laughs> practical application of the trumpet, I do not pray and meditate so that I become a better trumpet player. I pray and meditate to be a better me, right? And this doesn't mean that I don't play my Arbenz. It doesn't mean that I don't play my Schlossberg, my Stamp, you know, my Bichet Toots, whatever. I, I do all of that stuff. But the perspective that I have of those things now is not something that I have to do, but something that I get to do and becomes part of a song that is now freely sung. Rather than, you know, if, if you don't put in blankety blank hours a day, or if you don't play out of this book, or if you don't play out of this book, then you're going to suck when it matters. Okay, well, guess what? I did all those things. And I was still having a lot of trouble because I wasn't okay with me. They, so, look, if teachers really want to address what students are struggling with, they have to address the whole student. And people are people, humans being with hearts, with consciousnesses, with um, uh, souls. So, um yeah, the danger of that is trying to superimpose our own journey onto somebody else's rather than saying, tell me where you are, you know? Yeah. And in my experience, this is what's worked for me. This is what's happened for me, right? It's been suggested this by somebody that I know that I really admired. I tried this from them. I ignored that from them, right? It, it's It's... We're building our own lives, right? Uh, Panzarella used to talk about just trumpet sound that way as far as picking and choosing. I loved it. He said, um, he said, you're familiar with Gabriel, right? I said, the archangel? He said, yeah. He said, Gabriel, that's that's got to be the most heavenly trumpet sound around, right? Like high notes, low notes, tucka tucka, like amazing slurs never gets tired endurance just like beautiful sound just shimmering beautiful sound i said yeah cool cool he said well here's the deal nathan each one of us earthbound trumpet players has an idea of what gabriel sounds like right and you know if I, I, christianity notwithstanding i think christianity can, can be very toxic so it, put this in your own spiritual terms and it'll work, okay? Your own spiritual terms, your own understanding, right? Um, he said, every person has their own idea what Gabriel sounds like. He said, my idea is different than Phil Smith's. Phil Smith's is different than Bud Herseth. Bud's different from, you know, David Bilger. David Bilger is different from Tom Hooten. Tom Hooten's different from Dizzy Gillespie, different from Miles, different from Maynard, different from Louis Armstrong. I mean, there's so many different sounds. He said, your Gabriel will be all those trumpet players you've heard and admired and stolen from, because nobody's stuff is copyrighted. All those trumpet players you've ever heard and you steal from them and you put it together with Nathan Warner glue and that's your Gabriel. So your job every day is to play your Gabriel. Hmm. Dig? And he said, look, at all these disparate sounds, all these different varying approaches, what does that mean? there's room for more because if all of them have been wildly successful and changed the art form, that means that other people can too. Yeah. Well, and you know, and, and that's a, a real, like for me, that is a very touchy subject uh, in terms of, of sound because um, you know, when I, when I entered, uh, my, my undergrad, well, I never did graduate. So <laughs> it was, it was everything there. Um, well, it, it did Panzarella. <laughs> so, I mean, not all the masters have a diploma. Louis Armstrong didn't go to music school. 
yeah, yeah, well, that's yeah, that's very true. But I mean, one of the the biggest the you know, there, I, I can go into this this whole long litany on this, but but the the bottom line was uh, I didn't have a good sound. Now, I do realize now that uh, my sound at that point was not optimal in, in for, for what, what I was trying to accomplish. Um, it, it was the very strident, uh, exceptionally bright, uh, but it was, I was given the impression that I had a bad trumpet sound and that I needed to sound like this. And it was a very homogenous kind of sound. And it was kind of the cookie cutter approach. Well, you know, you, if you're going to be a, a, a trumpet player, you need to have a sound like Bud Herseth. And therefore you need to, to switch your gear and you need to be playing a Bach, you know, one and a quarter, and you need to be playing a Bach, you know, 32. And, and this is what you need to do so that you can sound like this, because this is a trumpet sound, as opposed to mm -hmm. you have a voice and you have a unique voice and let's work on that voice to make it the best version of your voice because if you listen to a vocalist whether it's uh, you know listening to beverly sills versus maria callas or whether it's listening to uh you know uh Pavarotti versus al Jarreau, you know right. all of the <laughs> love it unique voices and yeah you know, like you said there's room for all of them and depending on the venue you're in you know Pavarotti one of the greatest voices of all time I don't yeah. want to hear him sing take five <laughs> yeah I'm just I'm, I'm hearing Pavarotti trying to sing boogie down now and I don't yeah. think he'd make it <laughs> yeah his, his boogie well, would not have gotten down very far but but yeah <laughs> It's helping people to understand that it's okay to have a unique voice. And, and whether it's the, the sound of our horn or mm -hmm. the way we express our music, uh, the, mm -hmm. the vocabulary we use, are we using, you know, mm -hmm. orchestral vocabulary or jazz or Latin, you know, what, what vocabulary are you using? Or just the, the right. way we live our lives. We all have our own voice. We have our own contribution. Let's help people to find a way to make that the best possible one for them, as opposed to trying to make people conform to a limited image that we have of what is correct. I, I totally agree with you. I, I like 100% think that's legit, you know, I, and, and making those comparisons that you were making, you know, we can bring that to the trumpet vibe also. I mean, I don't want to hear Dizzy Gillespie try to play Heldenleben. Right. And I don't want to hear her Seth try to play, you know, hot house. It's, it's just not going to work. It's a totally different approach to music. Now um, what I will say, and I think this is, this is something that Bill Adam gave me as a, as a young pup that helped me a lot. He, he said, there's no difference between how you play the trumpet between classical jazz commercial whatever you play the way you play it's just style that's it okay so what that helped me to do was to realize i didn't have to th th this myth of being a classical player or a jazz player or a big band player or you know a, a lead guy or a low note dude or a multiple tongue or whatever look we love as humans to put people in these pigeonholed situations we want to label stuff we want to name it rather than having the openness to just see things as they are you, you talk about being a realist i mean that's just beholding without judging you know without labeling being open to things taking life as life comes and when he gave me that piece of advice i think what i realized was I want to learn as many styles as possible. I want to have so many different kinds of songs to sing because as a complex human being, I have a very wide range of emotions. I want to have a song for every single one of those. Yeah. And look, I'm sorry, but there's, <laughs> there's certain feelings that Bolero cannot express for me. Right. 
And there's certain feelings that, you know, Tito Puente Ran Can Can cannot express for me. And, and nothing against any of those because no other song can express what those songs express. I just want to be around all of it and have, when I look down at my palette as a painter, I have so many different colors from which to choose, right? Um, or even different mediums. So that green light from him helped a lot. A few years later, I remember approaching Pat Harbison. This is when I was still an undergrad in Indiana. Uh, and Pat gave me another really great green light. I was like, man, I'm not the best lead player. I'm not the best orchestral player. I'm not the best quintet player. I'm like, I why why can't I just get over the hump and be like, I'm not the, the best like improviser. And, and he said, stop. You're the only one here that can do all that. And that's when I realized, oh, that's, that's my thing, right? Maybe I'll never be the best lead player. Maybe I'll never be the best orchestral player. Maybe I'll never be the best improviser, but you know, you can hire me for anything. And it sounds like what I do for a full-time gig, right? And I started to, to realize <laughs> back in fifth grade, they handed us instruments or we were choosing instruments. And of course, in eighth, in uh, fifth grade, everyone was choosing alto sax because every 80s tune had some like squealing, goose calling alto solo in it, right? And I said, well, I'm of course, being an Enneagram 8, like I'm, I'm going to not do what everybody else is doing. Let me, let me do my own thing. But maybe I maybe I should choose an instrument where I could play like, classical jazz, like all these different styles. Before I even had the horn in my hand, that was in my head as a 10 year old. And so I just tried to be wide open so that whatever fell made an impression. I wanted to be that wet cement. So whatever touched it made an impression on it. Um, and I have to tell you, it has been an adventure. No two days have been the same. When the two days start to get a little bit alike, I get itchy and I reach out for something else. And it's, it has been the spice of life, my friend. Just yeah. wonderful. So, and, and, but that may not be true for everybody. Somebody, somebody may get that one job singing in an orchestra and feel the same way. Okay, so it comes down to motivation. For me, my purpose was to play a little bit of everything, right? I wanted to be the the freaking golden corral of <laughs> of trumpet. You know, I wanted to be the buffet, right? Like, let me get a little bit of mac and cheese, a little bit of greens. Let me make sure I get a little bit of ham. You know, like all all this stuff, all this stuff. My my thing is a Thanksgiving dinner when I sit down and look at my career, and it's. It's been so wonderful to do that. And I found that anytime I do one thing for too long, I get so itchy and restless and I need to, uh, to diversify the paints on my palette. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes, it's funny because I, I have talked about this a lot, um, that like for myself, um, I look at my life and I've had a lot of different things that I have done over the course of my life. And when I was younger, uh, I always had this feeling like, God, you're just, you're just a screw up. You know, you can't figure out what you want to do. You're bouncing around from this and that, the other thing, you know, when are you going to, you know, when are you going to figure it out and when are you going to commit to something? Um, and then uh, yeah, I got I got involved in, in my seriously in my martial arts career, and uh, I was in this is uh, maybe about 10, 15 years ago. I was in China. We we're uh, shooting a documentary for something, and one of the the people there uh, wrote. He's a very famous calligrapher, and he wrote this calligraphy for me. And mm -hmm. uh, I said, yeah, well, well, you know, what's the translation? And he said, uh, wide like the like wide and deep like the ocean is uh, 
you know, like the best of both words, worlds. So the idea is that you know some people have very deep knowledge on a specific topic. Some people have very broad knowledge. And he said, but when you have breadth and depth, that's that's a very special kind of person. And that you have that. And it's like, wow. And so it really made me start to think. And I look back over my life and I started to see how everything I did was just an expression of who I am innately. And yeah. It, it, so it wasn't different things. It was just different facets of who I am. And now I'm at a point where I'm looking back at my life uh, and, and going, oh, now I see how that fits. And I've been able to pull everything together into a, a, a portfolio lifestyle where I'm still doing a lot of different things, but I don't look at them as different things or just different expressions. They're all still me being me, but it's just putting a little focus, much like, you know, being, you know, if you're a lead player, you want to have a little more sizzle, you're going to have a little more high end. If you're playing, you know, in an orchestral setting, maybe you're going to tone it down a little bit. So it's just being able to shift where I put the emphasis, but understanding that it's not different. It's all serving me and allowing me to be the best version of myself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's 100%. I still remember Bill Adam telling me, look, you're, you're the best Nathan Warner there is. Right. So, you know, each one of us can substitute our name in there. And it's true, you know, uh, you know, when we go back to that, you are but dust thing, but for you, the universe is created. Well, the thing that that makes it real is that all of us are that way. All of us. And where I get in trouble is where I start to, you know, and Instagram is awful for this. We look at somebody else's life and they're doing all this stuff. And I start comparing. I get into a lot of trouble with that, right? I can get really less than I got to put the thing down and really, I, I need to be thankful for that person, thankful for what they have going on in their life. You know what? I've got some posts going up from time to time. Nobody else gets to have my life. I'm pretty lucky. You know, I'm, I'm extraordinarily fortunate to have had the life that I've had, you know? Um, because some people never find their purpose. Some people never have the luxury to even think about it. Um, it's an absolute privilege. And I, I, you know, I, I have my parents to thank for this. I have the incredible mentors I had coming up to thank for this, who, who gave me the green light, who gave me the blank check for artistry. Right. And somehow I ended up around a lot of people that continued to write blank checks right? And said, go ahead, fill this out. And did I make deposits to the school of Arbin? Yep. Did I put my nose in that green Schlossberg book? You bet I did, you know? Um, but somehow I always kept in mind that I went back to what it was like when I was a little kid before I even held a trumpet, that if you sing a song the right way, it is profound. I got to meet Itzhak Perlman once. I was at a, a recital that his daughter was giving. And I can't remember exactly how the conversation went, but I said, I said, Maestro, you have recorded some of the most beautiful versions of the major concertos, Tchaikovsky, Mendelssohn, et cetera, et cetera. How do you make them sound so beautiful? And, you know, Itzhak has this really low and, you know, deep, soulful voice. He said, well, you know, I'm, I shouldn't, I'm going to sound like Darth Vader if I do. <laughs> he said, you know, it, anybody can play the Mendelssohn. And because it's the Mendelssohn, it sounds beautiful. He said, it takes a genius to play Mary Had a Little Lamb and move people. And that's when I thought, ah, okay, so it's what I put into it. It's my job to put the ghost in there, to put the spirit in there. And that's why we don't have computers for orchestras. That's why even when they're using recorded music, it's recordings of humans, because it's that 
je ne sais quoi. It's that that extra something that AI cannot do, that only humans being can create. So I think one of the most important things that we can impart to young people studying music is how profoundly unique they are and how profoundly unique everyone around them is. And then when we come together to play even, you know, a Mozart symphony, which you wouldn't think would have that many expressive opportunities as say maybe, you know, a Strauss tone poem. We still have things to share here. And if nothing else, it's the cooperation that tells the story. It's the listening to each other's the compromise. It's the split second, I'll meet you where you are. And that life in music and what I learned from it is uh, that's what I'll take with me when I'm gone. You know, I can't take any of the horns with me. <laughs> you know, they need, they would need a U-Haul behind my hearse. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, those memories, right. I may not remember any particular horn that I played, but I'll remember the way the music made me feel when I played it. Right. And that to me is the absolute treasure of being a musician. Let's not forget the root of the word music. It's muse, right? These demi goddesses of inspiration, right? Music is a study of inspiration and a musician is someone whose vocation it is to inspire. Tuka, tuka, tuka. <laughs> cool. So, you know, what is it we're really doing here, right? People don't go and hear Yo Yo Ma just because his double stops are in tune. It's because this guy is 100% invested in every note and offering of himself to people. May I never forget that. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, that's just, uh, that's an interesting line of thought because, you know, the, the way, you know, we'll go back to talking about like the, the education system. Um, it's, it's set up to focus primarily on how we execute things like the technique uh but how do you teach someone to be themselves how do you i mean i know because i agree with you, you can't teach anybody anything you, you know you because you know you mm -hmm. learn it on your own you can share information but but how how can we as educators regardless of of the field of education how can we help people to understand uh, that it is this unique personal journey? It is as a musician, it is an inspirational uh, thing. You are the you are the muse, um, right? Uh, and and uh, how can you help people to peel away the layers so that that they can actually get the music out? You know, I th I think it starts with a perfect combination of affirmation and confrontation. Um, another great writer, Henry Nowen, says that um, love provides hospitality, not hostility. In fact, one of the great spiritual journeys is moving from hostility to hospitality, giving a space where a person can just be. And but he also says that love, whether we like it or not, a necessary ingredient is confrontation. And the way we do that, I think, says a lot about how we love. And that's why I'm really into the yes and thing. Um, you know, your sound is really, really beautiful. I don't think you realize how beautiful it is because you're tonguing every note so hard. I'm not sure you realize that that the tone itself makes an incredible impact. And there's no need to tongue that hard because it actually impedes, it actually gets in the way of a beautiful song being sung. What if you tried a little bit less tonguing here, a little bit harder, a little less uh, strident of an articulation, you'll find that the song I think probably comes out better. Let's experiment with that. And what student won't reply to respond to that, right, rather than, I don't like your sound, which is what a lot of teachers might say. They make it a whole sound thing. It's like they throw the baby out in the bathwater with that. And I've heard great 
trumpet teachers, players say this to students, and I can't imagine how devastating that is. Rather than let's take this thing here, which is really working for you, right? And use it to progress to unveil something that's already there, right? Rather than you can't, you know what I'm saying? So my, my teaching philosophy personally is because this is how I practice. I'm always trying to use what I can do to achieve what I have yet to do. Notice I didn't say can't. Um, and that way everything becomes an option, right? It becomes a safe environment in which to try new things and um, practice all of, all of a sudden becomes not punitive, but possible. I like that. So do I. It's, been, it's much more fun this way. <laughs> That's good stuff, man. That is really good stuff. Uh, and you know what? Um, I have a, I have the distinct feeling that, that we could go on and on and on and on about some of these uh, deep rabbit holes, but uh, uh, I know time is limited, and I have uh, three segments we got to get through uh, on this. So I guess we'll, we'll we'll say we'll save some of these conversations uh, for the next time I have you on the hang. Uh, oh, I'd love it. I'd love it. Or the, yeah, actually, you know, I would love to have you and Mary and Dave on together. Mm -hmm. I think that would just be be a hoot. <laughs> Man, it's like it's like Neapolitan ice cream. You know what I mean? It's like three flavors in one one cart, man. And the the thing is, we're so different, and yet we get each other and uh, appreciate and support each other so deeply. It's um, it, it's just such a privilege to be friends and colleagues with those two incredible musicians and people yeah well you know and that's it, like when we talk about music and you know music and life uh i think that's one of the greatest skills that that we are privileged to learn as being musicians uh is how to work in an ensemble you know how to be a part of something uh and and play your role and contribute uh in a in a way that that is ne not necessarily the same as someone else, but you you understand how to listen to each other, how to to complement each other, how to support each other, how to take the lead when you need to take the lead, um, how to fly by the seat of your pants when the changes come up. Um, so yeah. I mean, th those are all great life skills. Um, but if you if you always look at music as being the tucka tucka tucka, then you never you never really get the full picture. So. Yeah, I, it's yeah. eating without flavor, you know, it, and it's barely nourishment that way. It's filling the stomach, but not not actually enjoying the uh, the eating process. So yeah. like COVID not having uh, any taste. I mean, that's <laughs> right. Right. Some of us have been there. Yeah, <laughs> no, no fun. No fun. All right. Well, let, let's get on to to our, our, our first uh, standard segment. And uh, you're going to love this one. Uh, this is uh, called Sound Off and it's brought to us by uh, my good friend Michael Barkley of Barkley Microphones. Sound Off is about to approach the sound. Now, we've been talking about sound a little bit and about the uniqueness of sound. Um, so let's just maybe just dive a little bit deeper into that of uh ways that people can better develop uh their gabriel how how do you how do you mm. that process of finding their gabriel that's a, a great question um i think the first thing is to avail oneself to um to input so for example um Many people grow up in a community where there is an orchestra around or a jazz orchestra or a small jazz group or a brass quintet or whatever live near them and yet never go. Um, that's actually very common in this part of the world where I live in, in Eastern Tennessee. We have orchestras here and the band kids never go. They never go. And it, it's very... I'm absolutely befuddled. Um, they'll go to a DCI contest, but and they'll drive two hours for that, but they won't drive half an hour to go hear the orchestra. So most kids around here think that DCI is kind of like the the absolute zenith of a music career. Um, 
which, you know, don't get me wrong. It's a, 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 I'm sure a great experience for a lot of people, but there's other stuff to do. So my thing is get yourself around what inspires you, you know, and when you're not around what inspires you, get around recordings of that, which inspires you, um, and feed the sound image, right? I've got a, a good friend who plays with the uh, Washington National Opera in um, in D.C. at the Kennedy Center, and for he he won one of the trumpet spots there. And as he was getting ready for his audition, he didn't sit in the room and play like crazy. He put on noise canceling headphones and listened to Phil Smith play the excerpts, and he just communed with that he said i'm gonna play like this i'm gonna play like this and he started rehearsing in his head how he wanted to play it he went in and won the audition you know barely playing a note beforehand so um yeah figuring out our sound is great i think part of it is what lights you up like a christmas tree when you hear it who has the sound that you want and listen to those cats like crazy and copy them people ask me all the time um man, how, how your shakes just seem so easy. Um, was it from, you know, page 43 in the Arben book, you know, doing those, the sex tuplets over and over and like, no, no, I listened to Louis Armstrong. I learned his solos and I tried to play it just like him. And guess what? It was easy for him. So I was emulating something for whom or something uh, that for Louis was easy. Right. So that that's it. Just copy. Now, I also used to, you know, hang out in my backyard and shoot hoops and pretend, pretend I was Michael Jordan. That didn't work out as well. <laughs> but I, I got better, right? So a lot of it's about just pretending to be your heroes early on. Yeah. Okay, cool. I, I like it. I like it a lot. All right. Uh, next segment. Uh this is uh, always uh, the, the thing that, that uh, every trumpet player wants to talk about. This is about gears. It's called Geared Up. It's brought to us by Venture Mouthpieces. <laughs> Venture, where technology, design, and craftsmanship intersect. Use the code uh, TrumpetGurus21 to get 10% off your order. So gear, gear, gear. But in my typical trumpet gurus fashion, uh, it's not so much about what you play, but why. Why, why, uh, yeah. why do you approach and how do you approach uh the the role of of uh gear in creating our gabriel and I, i'm gonna you need to trademark that you know create your gabriel um, it's it vince is 100 and i also know him uh enough about my my beloved mr penzarella that if i did try to trademark that he'd come for me <laughs> <laughs> all right well, well we'll give him a cut yeah okay. all right cool cool uh, but so, so like you know your your like your approach to gear and uh, uh, definitely as, from the educational standpoint you know how mm -hmm. how do you educate because i think that's one of the things that really has uh that's been missing from the overall curriculum is mm -hmm. uh you know what is gear what is the importance of it how do you make how do you make informed decisions on what you need to be playing boy that's this is my most difficult and probably least favorite question you've asked today. And I mean that in the most loving way, but uh, <laughs> it's hey, a tough one because again, you know, what's funny is that what I play, I would, I would probably not recommend to anybody. Very, very few people. Penzarella handed me a one, a Bach one C with a 22 hole and a 24 back bore. And that's what those guys were playing on their C trumpets. And it's a massive mouthpiece, man. I mean, it was larger than my, my Manhattan apartment. And this thing, it took me a while to get it going, but I didn't understand that it was just for C trumpet playing. So I was playing it on the B flat, which was like kind of nutty, but I figured it out. And like to the point where I've got a, a really full, big double G on this mouthpiece. I don't recommend that to, I've never recommended that to any student of mine. It works for me, right? And, you know, when I play lead, I just use a stock 3C. Um, and going from a 1C to that, it's like taking the donut off the bat, man. It's like, okay, now I can swing really freely when I'm going for, you know, the 
earth wound and fire stuff or whatever um i don't really switch horns i've got a bach 37 that i like um i know that bach is is working on these 190s at the plant right now that are um trying to go back to the mount vernon tradition i have a mount vernon which i like a lot the receiver's a little bit worn out um i might adapt that at some point uh you know it's like having a vintage sports car you're afraid to drive it on more than just sundays you know um yeah i tend not to think about equipment so much i i am usually the person who when something is not going the way i want i look at me first rather than the equipment and if if the problem is insurmountable thereafter then i'll start to think about equipment some but what i found is that when i go and i spend money on on new equipment it's I suffer from the delusion that the equipment is going to solve my problem rather than continuing to focus on the archer, not the arrow. You dig? So, um, you know, and I used to do all this stuff in high school. You know, I'd go out and get the sound sleeve and the heavy valve caps and the trim kit and, um, you know, the uh, the thing that connects the mouthpiece to the receiver and and putting a cork between like the third valve slide and, you know, all these, all these things. And I remember getting to college and I had a bunch of cats in my big band section who just played like down the middle trumpets and sounded great. And one day I'm sitting in the section and all of them are chuckling and looking at me and I, I'm like, what guys? And they said, we're laughing at your horn. <laughs> Cause it just had all this stuff like on it. You know, it, 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 it was starting to, my horn was starting to look like a Swiss army knife. And uh, they were right to make fun of me. They're like, you know, and, and I had teachers who said, look, if Phil Smith can play like some down the middle stuff and sound like that, you know, if, if it was that that made us great, wouldn't more people have that? So it, it not to say that that people can't make their own decisions on equipment or whatever, because, again, there's so many different approaches, Right. Dizzy Gillespie sounded great on a bent up horn and a tiny little mouthpiece, right? Um, it wasn't necessarily his whole note that was incredible. It was the way in which he played rhythm and harmony and had humor and dynamics and development. So, man, find your way. Find your way. But, I, yeah, I'm on a, you know, a, a stock Bach 37 off the line, medium large bore. I play a 1C mouthpiece with a 22 hole, 24 back bore, and uh, 3C when I play lead. I've got a, a C trumpet that is um, 229 bell, H pipe, 25 H pipe. You know, pretty vanilla stuff, nothing extraordinary. Um, I've got uh, two piccolos. I have a, a Shilke for a valve, and I have a Scherzer piccolo rotary, which I like. I've got a Bach Artisan E flat, which I just got to play the Haydn on. That was a lot of fun. Um, I like it because it's not as nasal as um, some of the other E flats, and it slots really well. Um, yeah, and then I've got like a bunch of other like kind of little specialty horns that I barely spend any time on. Um, I do have a, a Canstall Copper Bell Flugel, which is you know darker than the Emperor. Um, and I love it. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's my gear pretty much. But again, my, my gear is, is this and this, right. And I, that's what I'm trying to work on all the time. And my job is to try to get the gear out of the way. So it, there's, there's no, there, there's near, there is no trumpet, right. It's only song. Yeah. yeah I like that. Only song. We'll make that the, the second run of t-shirts. So uh, <laughs> right on. Yeah. Okay. All right. Awesome. All right. Final segment. Uh, and I think you're going to love this one. This is brought to us by Robinson's Remedies, rapid relief for your sore and tired chops. This is the Robinson's Remedy rapid fire round a series of questions that kind of bounce all over the place. I just need your quickest response. Cool. Nathan, are you ready? Let's go. All right. Here we go. First question. Who's the biggest influence in your life that is not a trumpet player? My parents. All right. What is your favorite book? 
Return of the Prodigal Son by Henry Nowen. What's the worst movie you've ever seen? <laughs> um uh what's what's the one about the uh the jazz one that just came out with a like tyrannical director uh um, with uh it's it's the all-state insurance guy with you know what i'm talking about oh, the all-state insurance guy yeah it, it's the, the oh come on what's the i'm looking this up because i want to be quick the um come on it was so bad There's a uh, um, whiplash. 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 Worst movie. Worst movie. All right. Uh, if you were not a trumpet player, what would you want to be? A guru. Ah, see, you are. All right. <laughs> uh, what is your favorite drink? Ah. <sighs> I make a special Manhattan uh -oh. with, uh, yeah, the parts, the parts that are uh, sweet vermouth, the part that is sweet vermouth, I cut in half and I use half of that sweet vermouth and half Grand Marnier uh, with uh, my family label bitters, Fee Brothers, my mom's side of the family, they, they've been making bitters since uh, the Civil War. So you're, yeah. you're, you're related to the Fee Brothers? Yeah. Yeah. So if you look at the the sticker at the top, there's four brothers to the top of the bottle. The second one from the left is my great 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 grandfather, John C. Fee the first. Oh, I love Fee Brothers bitters. I, Good stuff. I have a few bottles at home, and uh, they're, my, they're so fantastic. Here's my here's my Manhattan. I I skip the vermouth, vermouth and I mm -hmm. use uh, Luxardo, the mirror. Oh yeah. So absolutely pour. Boom. There you go, man. That's banging. There you go. Also put a little bit of the maraschino uh, syrup from the cherries in when I yeah. shake it. I, yeah. I, I tend to like a sweeter Manhattan, but that's just me. Yeah. Me too. Yeah, sometimes I'll even put Salerno, which is a blood orange liqueur. Oh, yeah. yeah right so on. Luxardo, Salerno, uh, usually mm -hmm. a, a nice, uh, nice uh, even bourbon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. when we get together, we're going to have to make Manhattans for each other. I was just thinking that. Yeah. 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 We'll have at least one. And, and my experience with Manhattans is that one is never enough and two is way too many. <laughs> and <yeah. laughs> <I have> to... <laughs> cool. Cool. Well, I'll drive. It's all good. Okay, cool. All right. Here we go. Next question. Um, you could have a dinner party and mm -hmm. invite any three people in the world any three people and let's exclude like you know the the usual suspects like your your family and stuff like that uh so who would you uh, like to have there the dalai lama gandhi he's not alive oh alive yeah, alive my bad three living people okay. sorry 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 um the dalai lama um living <sighs> um richard Rohr and the pope okay cool just to watch <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting conversation and i, I think yeah. it would go completely different than a lot of people would anticipate so mm -hmm. uh, now you have three additional chairs at your dinner table and you can have any three people from history so any three people no longer with us great all right so that's where i would invite gandhi um mother Teresa, and dr king mm, man that, that sounds like a great dinner party. All right. Uh, lacquer, plated, or raw? <laughs> um, lacquer, plated, and raw. Ah. You're, you're a yes and kind of guy. I, I got it. Correct. That. All right. What's your favorite quote? Um. 
I'm, I'm trying to remember to whom this was attributed. I'll get it real quick. Um, Oscar Wilde. Be yourself. Everyone else is already taken. Very good. All right. Be yourself. Everyone else is already taken. Yeah, I love that. Okay, cool. Uh, what's your greatest fear? Um, abandonment. All right. Uh, you could be granted one superpower. What would it be? Healing. Mm -hmm. uh, what aspect of trumpet playing do you find to be the most overrated? Um, high notes. And what aspect do you find to be the most underrated? Phrasing. Mm -hmm. You can go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice about music. What would it be? Accept love from it more without taking. And uh, you give your younger self one piece of advice about life. Accept love from it more without taking. Life is music. Music is life. Yeah. yeah. Right, final question for you, uh, Nathan. What do you want your legacy to be? Mm. that I gave everyone permission mm. that, that I helped create an environment in which everyone could be exactly who they were, including myself. What a wonderful world that would be. I agree. Yeah. Still yeah. working on that. <laughs> well, we're all works in progress. So, you know, correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it, it's the it's the progress versus perfection idea. I agree. So yeah. So man, hey, this has been a complete joy for me uh, to talk with you. Uh, you know, definitely, I feel like we we're kindred spirits in so many ways. I agree. Um, you know, I think people would have a hard time uh, telling us apart if uh, if you shaved your head. So. <laughs> <laughs> cool man right. yeah and I, I really value this time together too you know to to be in an environment where you can tell your story and feel totally free to do it is becoming increasingly special these days because most people have an agenda with where they want to steer things but i i love the fact that we were given one mouth but two ears so thank you for your ears and thank you for what came into my ears today uh, well, this has been has been an absolute blast, and I look forward to uh, staying connected with you and and uh, keeping track on on what's going on with with uh, you both uh, as an individual uh, and also what you're doing collectively with uh, with Mary and, and Dave. So uh, you know that, that's great stuff. And, and please support uh, Apex. And uh, links are in the show notes for for all of that that good stuff. So uh, you can follow Dave. Uh, follow uh, what Nathan's doing. You can you can follow what Apex is doing. Make sure uh, check out uh, check out the upcoming event and uh, keep tabs on them for any new things that are coming down the pike. Because I'm I'm really feeling like you guys are going to uh, have more that you're going to offer uh, in as as things go on. So so the the depth and breadth I'm sure is going to be there, and the quality will always be paramount. So. Uh, thank you for what yeah. you're doing because it's something that, that the trumpet community sorely, sorely needs and the world needs even more so. So thank you, my friend. Thank you, brother. Thank All you right. so much. And thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Oh, my pleasure. And thank you for joining us for this episode. Make sure that you like, subscribe, share. Uh, and uh, do all that good stuff. If you have a uh, question, hit me up. Uh, if you have a suggestion for a guest or a topic you'd like me to, to uh, discuss, let me know because we're all about serving you. All right. So as always, folks, peace and slide grease. We out. Thanks for hanging with us today. 
This podcast is all about creating deeper connections through our mutual love of music and the trumpet life.